Yo, Denny, where are you from? Uh, this city just made a bold move to end poverty. Yeah, but where is it? 28 perks of living in a warm climate. Oh, so it's warm. 10 ways you know you're from Florida. Where in Florida? Six actors you didn't know were from Orlando. Yeah, why won't you just answer my question? How to stay healthy when you- Why won't you just say anything else? I never have anything interesting to say, so I just make up titles to get people's attention. Please don't yell at me anymore. I just want to do oh. my job. Oh. God, um, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just let you do your job. Jeff says I can do my job, but what happens next will surprise what you. What happens next won't surprise you. Holy oh. shit! What's up, Greg? Hope everybody's having a great day or a great night. Let's go ahead and get into this. Danny, known for his quirky personality, consistently delivers videos that defy cringe-worthy norms, even though some of his video has been cringe, but at a young age, who wasn't? With over 16 years of experience since his seventh grade debut, Danny has managed to create a distinct style. Notably, his journey began during the golden era of Vine, which is funny because I never actually saw him on Vine, and here I am making an entire video about him. I actually found him two years ago, and I believe that the way he makes contents, other people should try to emulate, not his specific style. I'm talking about his method, and we're going to go over that. Danny has successfully blended his musical talents with his social media presence, making music and editing seamless components of his content. While other social media stars grapple with the decision of focusing solely on one aspect, Danny has found a way to harmoniously combine both. Instead of choosing between videos and music, Danny embraces a mix of the two, allowing him to excel in both areas and maintain a distinct identity in the digital space. Well, then I'm out. I got a more important place to be. Bye bye. Probably Starbucks. I drink a lot of tea. Try, try, try. If your house is solar powered, you agree. I can trust you. Invite me to your house, and if it's not, I will judge you. Your penguin killing ways will get the best of ya. I'm so green that I'm better than the rest of ya. You got a compost bin? I'm not impressed with ya. My house runs on vegetable oil, and I've never felt a woman. My car's so fast, my car so mean. My car so fast, yeah, my car so clean. My car so fast, my car so mean. My car save gas, yeah, my car so green. What's up, guys? Hope you're having a great day. Now, I get a lot of comments asking me what my daily routine is, so I don't ask you that. Yeah, I do. I, I get this question all the time. No, you're just making that up so you can make this video. No, seriously, I, I get this question a lot. Okay, fine. Show me one comment of somebody asking me for your daily routine. Okay, fine. Here, this person. This person right here. Okay, you cropped the photo. Look, that's you. You know what? Shut up, okay? I want to make a video about my daily routine. I don't care if they asked or not. Nobody has to ask. I hope you're ready to see my daily routine, because I'm going to show you anyway. Jeez, somebody got up on the wrong side of the bed. Danny's skits stand out for the simplicity in his willingness to fully immerse himself in the performance. By embracing the over-the-top nature of skits, he captivates audiences and sets himself apart from creators who play it safe. Many content creators fall into the trap of chasing viral moments and optimizing their content for the algorithm. While it's important to consider optimization, it's crucial for you to stay to your personality and focus on creating content that resonates with your audience. When your channel is driven by your unique perspective and style, viewers will be drawn to your content regardless of its format or length. Just a quick note, if you want to make shorts, make shorts. If you want to make long form videos, make long form videos, guys. I have seen uh, the other day I was watching a 12 hour commentary video. And it did well. I couldn't believe it. But it just goes to show you, it doesn't matter. People care about you and your content. So just get out there and put it in the work. Then I need to come up with a YouTube video idea. So I spent about an hour thinking of the worst possible video that I could make. I'll make a video about my daily routine. Wow, that sounds awful. Let's do it. Then at noon, I take a break to eat some lunch. I usually eat my dog Peanut for lunch and then go to the pet store and buy an identical dog. That way none of my roommates notice. Now it's one o'clock and it's time to start filming our video. So I get a lot of comments asking me what my daily routine is. What's up guys, hope you're having a great day. So I get a lot of comments asking me what my daily routine is. People don't know this, but I spend hours shooting each video. Now it's one o'clock and it's time to start filming my video. What's up guys, hope you're having a great day. So I get a lot of comments asking me what my daily routine is. Now it's one o'clock and it's time to start filming my video. What's up guys, hope you're having a great day. So I get a 
lot of comments asking me what my daily routine is. Now it's one o'clock and it's time to start filming my video. What's up guys, hope you're having a great day. Now it's one o'clock and it's time to start filming my video. At this part of my day, I usually get stuck in some kind of weird loop where I'm explaining what I'm filming and I'm filming what I'm explaining. And I'm explaining what I'm filming and I'm filming what I'm explaining and I'm explaining what I'm filming and I'm filming what I'm explaining and so on. It's a paradox of sorts and I usually spend the rest of my day trying to escape it. Now it's about 10 p.m. and I've spent about eight hours trying to escape from this paradox. I've lost all sense of time and I've lost all sense of space. There are now hundreds of different versions of me wandering around the apartment acting out various portions of this video. I'll make a video about my daily routine. Man, you should go check out that video. It's called My Daily Routine. Um, just go check it out. It was made about like five, six years ago. Anyway, we're moving on to the storytelling part. This is what really got me interested in Danny to start with. Channels like Danny's demonstrate how a distinct perspective and engaging storytelling can make all the difference. Even if multiple creators cover the same topic, their individual perspectives and spins on them sets them apart and captures the attention of the viewers. Danny's ability to do this effectively is a testament to his talent and dedication. Reflecting on my own journey, I realized that I fell into a trap of chasing trends and experimenting with different content formats. While I learned valuable lessons along the way, I ultimately found that it took away from my passion and enjoyment of the creative process. By returning to the type of content I truly enjoy making, I was able to rediscover my enthusiasm and produce better quality videos. I went through the whole phase of making daily content as you guys have already seen and um, even you know you notice my face isn't on camera most of the time anymore because I do enjoy being behind the scenes and making videos like this uh, but I got caught up in that well you need to make this many videos and you need to have this uh, many uh, reaction videos and I just kind of found myself just like I don't really like this and it was actually starting to affect my actual life my actual life outside of here at work and stuff because I was just constantly thinking I got to get home and make a video I got to get home and make a video now that I take my time and make a video exactly how I want it it just is easier on my mind it is important to remember that trends come and go but your passion is timeless prioritize your enjoyment and authenticity and your audience will appreciate the genuine connection you have with your content mouse scares him and he falls that's pretty fucked up to scare an egg you know how fragile eggs are this dude breaks every five seconds and you're gonna scare him while you're in a treehouse <laughs> To be fair, it does seem like he immediately regrets it though, because he screams, No! That mouse seems legitimately traumatized by what she's done. Dude, if I was Humpty Dumpty, I would be pissed in this situation. I'd be like, I was a perfectly frozen statue. Nothing could hurt me. I was basically in a coma. But then you kids had to come and touch me, and now I can't go two seconds without falling off a wall and shattering into pieces. Do you have any idea how hard it is to be an egg? No, you've never been an egg in your life. Next time I shatter, can you just let me die? Don't get the horses and the men. Don't get the rabbit or the mouse. Just let me die, please. Danny's humor is perfect for storytelling. His entertaining commentary in his videos keeps viewers engaged with his kid-friendly content. And when I say kid-friendly, I mean the content he's making fun of is kid-friendly, not himself. Anyway, furthermore, he is not afraid to incorporate more mature humor for older audiences. Now, the journey of self-discovery and passion and content creation is a fascinating one. For many, it starts with the desire to find direction and purpose. For me, it was the realization that sticking with my passion and tweaking my content strategy was possible. When I used to think about how I had to conform to a certain mold or style to succeed, I found inspiration in YouTubers like Danny who continued to put in effort editing and producing videos despite the challenges. Every week, I take the time to watch and learn from small YouTubers like myself, I find immense joy in watching others talk about topics they love, even if their videos have few views. This reminds me that authenticity and passion shine through, regardless of the size of the audience, because it's so easy to get caught up in the analytics. Now, the analytics can be a valuable tool, but I believe that content creators solely focus on them. You got to be careful because they provide insights to what your audience likes and how they implement those things. However, when it comes to pursuing any dream, it is challenging not to conform to the expectations of others. YouTubers in particular tend to fall into the trap of by paying too much attention to the comment section, uh, you know, the tension or whatever, retention and all that kind of stuff. Hitting 70% retention every single time. Just don't focus on that too much. Focus on making the best video you can possibly make at that time. If it doesn't get there, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It doesn't mean you'll never be a YouTuber. I think people get so caught up in this, especially people who are personality YouTubers. Now, people who do business, 
okay, maybe they have a different life. But I'm talking about people who have their personality on here and they do this because they love it. Improve here and there, but don't get so caught up in, man, I have to hit this metric. If I don't, video failed, I should just quit. It, don't do that, man. Love your videos because honestly, these videos are a part of your life. They are a part of your memory that you're making. So don't forget about that. Don't forget about the experience of making the video and then crunch it down to just numbers. Now, for those people who get caught up in the comment section, I want to say the problem with relying solely on comments for guidance is that it can lead to a loss of identity and authenticity. It's like being a sports athlete who is constantly bombarded with the advice from fans and critics. The best athletes know that the key to success is turning off social media during the season and instead trusting their own abilities and the guidance of their coaches and teammates to help them get through. As content creators, we often fail to build a team of trusted individuals to guide us. Instead, we focus on our audience, which sometimes can lead us astray. It's essential to have a support system of friends, mentors, or even fellow content creators who offer constructive criticism and help us stay grounded. Another example I can draw from is the music industry. I have seen countless videos about the downfall of nameless artists, and it often comes down to the artists letting criticism get to them. It's crucial to allow ourselves to have ups and downs, but to produce content that we genuinely enjoy and that reflects our unique perspectives. True artists let their life experiences and emotions shape their work, and it's evident in their quality of their creations. Gavin is in that class, but she's too scared to talk to him, so scared, in fact, she just leaves class. Instead of not talking to him and being shy in class, she's just gotta get out of there. How does the teacher not notice them just get up and leave the class? You can hear her talking in the background as Tara is leaving. Is the teacher just completely up against the board talking the entire time? All right, class, today we're gonna learn about whiteboards and how you have to stand really close to them in order to see anything on them. I really hope no one's leaving the class right now, but I have no idea. I really hope that when I turn around, there's still gonna be people in the class because I haven't looked at you guys for the past 20 minutes. So as Radio Rebel starts to get more and more popular, Tara's stepdad ends up hearing about Radio Rebel because he's actually the head of one of the most popular radio stations in Seattle. And he decides he wants to hire Radio Rebel. But first he wants like a teenager's opinion about it, so he goes to talk to his step freak, Tara. Hey, Damn, I can tell why Radio Rebel's so popular. She always plays such cool music. You know, I find it funny that the name of that video is just I'm Radio Rebel and the thumbnail is just kind of bland, but it still did very well. Um, I know Danny takes a lot of time when he makes his own videos and the scripting and everything. And you know, that kind of led me to start pushing myself to write scripts because I love expressing myself than writing. Um, the rise of reaction channels led me to start, you know, doing all my thoughts live. You know, when you guys saw me streaming and I started doing a lot more daily video content, as I talked about earlier. But I had to trust the people around me to guide me back to my roots in writing and teaching. It's a funny story, actually, because in college, I was told to pursue a career in writing, but I refused to do it for many years. Uh, people recognized my talent, but I didn't see writing as a lucrative field. And if I had embraced it earlier, I would have found my way into journalism, which probably would have led me to YouTube much earlier. But instead, you know, life goes on. Now, this video you're seeing in the background right now is uh, Danny's commentary on the video scales. And that is what made me make this whole video, actually. Um, I saw this a long time ago, but I watched it again here recently and I started thinking to myself more and more about how he's really gave me a different look and a different outlook on all of this stuff. So yeah, so a lot of this video is not gonna be focused on this video in particular. After watching this video around 20 times, I finally watched this movie myself the other day and Danny's ability to tell a story and provide a synopsis while making it entertaining is truly remarkable. It's no wonder his channel continues to thrive with each video as he consistently delivers quality content that his audience knows and loves like yeah water's pretty cool i like drinking it but then she got a little bit too into it and i was like huh she's like i've always dreamed about water living in it tasting it breathing it loving it loving the water low-key smashing the water dude and spoiler alert she is a mermaid we find out later in the movie that she's a mermaid i know big twist right so it makes sense that she would like yearn for the water, I guess, but I don't know. Like, I've never heard humans talk about air that way. Mm, let me get a taste of that air. I gotta love that air. Sorry to spoil so early on in the movie that the girl finds out she's a mermaid, but I mean, 
The movie's called Mermaids Are Real. What did you expect it to be about? She finds out mermaids are real and then just gets to watch them do cool shit for the rest of the movie, but she doesn't get to join in. And yet, in life, I stay pretty far away from it. What does she mean she stayed pretty far away from water? How do you stay far away from water your whole life? I just picture someone like inviting her over to their house and her being like, um, don't you have a pool? And like sinks and stuff. I'm sorry, dude. I try to stay away from that type of shit. You try to stay away from water? Yeah, cause you never know. I mean, if I get too close to water, I might forget how to act, shit. I might try to breathe it and love it. Oh, ew. But then after her narration, she immediately wakes up, pounds two glasses of water, and then goes to look out the window at the ocean that she lives right next to. So, what happened to staying away from water her whole life? She literally lives at the ocean. Her room literally doesn't even have walls. So she can just look at the ocean all the time. Now, it's crazy that that Radio Rebel video we just saw had 17 million views. This video right here has 18 million views. And Danny himself has over 6 million subscribers. And I've just noticed that it's truly remarkable to observe the contrasting attitudes of YouTubers for varying levels of subscribers. On one hand, some creators with a mere 100,000 subscribers may exhibit conceited behavior seemingly oblivious to the privilege and responsibility that comes with their platform. On the other hand, these guys like Danny, they are YouTubers with millions of subscribers who continue to film from their bedrooms, displaying a grounded and humble approach, in my opinion. This stark contrast highlights the significant role of individuals upbringing and environment in shaping their perspective on success and fame. Now, obviously, I don't know Danny, so I have no idea why he is the way he is. Now, I know he does a lot of, you know, Photoshop and all that kind of stuff, and he has great skills when it comes to that. But when I say humble, I'm just saying, like, I've never really seen this man go, hey, this is everything I got. Here's all this money I'm making. He just never broke out into that. But I watch other YouTubers who do this same thing, have less subscribers than him, and they act like they're the top of the world, like they're famous. And it's like, Cinnamon Toast Ken talks about this. You know, we got to realize that at the end of the day, if you are a YouTuber making money, you know, it is privilege. But you're, that doesn't make you a celebrity or makes you better than anyone. And just make sure that you don't get too caught up. For some creators, monetary gains serve as the primary driving force behind their content creation. They may prioritize financial success over being themselves and the quality of their work, leading them to adopt a conceited attitude. In contrast, other creators are driven by a genuine passion for their craft and the desire to connect with their audience. They recognize that fame is fleeting and that building meaningful content for their viewers is of the utmost importance. These creators remain grounded even as their subscriber count grows exponentially. All right, look, Greg, I didn't mention this in the last video because I didn't know when it was going to stop or if it would stop, but my channel recently just blew the absolute hell up. I have no idea why. I went from having like less than 700,000 subscribers a month ago to having almost a million. Now I have like 976,000 subscribers right now when I'm recording this. The trying Troom Troom's prank video that I posted a few weeks ago randomly just shot from like 500,000 views to over 3 million views. And so now there's a bunch of new Gregs here. I don't really know why the YouTube algorithm decided that everybody needed to see that video, but I'm not complaining. So anyway, welcome to the over 300,000 new Gregs that I've accumulated in the past month. Just remember, if you hit that subscribe button and that notification button, that means that you're truly Greg now. And if you're Greg, you're part of the fastest growing channel on YouTube. Don't look that up. You're part of a family. All Gregs are blood related. Not a lot of people know that. And you owe your soul to me. That's right. Hitting the subscribe button technically sells your soul to me, but I'm sure you guys already knew that because it's in the fine print on the subscribe button on my channel. So everybody already knows that. Anyway, thank you for subscribing. Welcome to Greg. Now let's complain. The importance of nurturing relationships cannot be overstated. When creators prioritize their circle and build genuine connections with them, it helps keep them grounded and focus on creating content that resonates with their viewers. A supportive and engaged community can provide a sense of fulfillment and purpose, reminding creators of the impact they are making in the lives of others. This, in turn, fosters a sense of humility and gratitude, preventing them from becoming overly conceited or arrogant. Ultimately, the contrasting attitudes of YouTubers with varying subscriber counts serves as a reminder that success and fame are not the sole determinants of a creator's character. It is the individual's upbringing, environment, and personal values that play a crucial role in shaping their perspective and behavior. By emphasizing the significance of relationships and nurturing a grounded approach, creators can navigate the challenges of fame and maintain a healthy balance between their personal and professional lives. YouTube indeed offers balanced opportunities, which never ceases to amaze me. 
Setting a goal of reaching a million subscribers can be both thrilling and daunting, as it represents a significant milestone for creators. However, it's important to remember that the journey to a million subscribers is unique for every individual. This may experience a meteoric rise to fame due to a viral video that captures the world's attention. In such cases, they might quickly amass a million subscribers and achieve widespread recognition. Others may take a more gradual approach, consistently creating high quality content that resonates with their audience. This slower organic growth often fosters deeper engagement with viewers, creating a loyal and dedicated community. It's crucial to recognize that the number of subscribers is ultimately an arbitrary metric. While reaching a million subscribers can be a significant achievement, it should not define your success as a creator. Your true worth lies in your impact that you are able to make on your audience, the connections you forge, and the memories you create through your videos. In 10 years, your path may lead you to far greater heights than a million subscribers. You might have established a successful career outside of YouTube, where the platform served as a stepping stone to showcase your talents and build your brand. Your influence and reach could extend far beyond the confines of the platform, touching the lives of millions in meaningful ways. The beauty of YouTube lies in its ability to provide a springboard for diverse aspirations. Whether it's regarding a million subscribers, building a thriving community, or pursuing a different career altogether, the platform offers endless possibilities to those who embrace its potential. Social media is not the only path to success. As I explained in my Darman video, I've met YouTubers who create content while pursuing acting careers in Los Angeles. Another content creator initially aspired to be a professional baseball player, but launched their career on YouTube before realizing they still love baseball, and now they're pursuing that career again. Now, I've noticed that Danny's videos consistently receive a high number of views, which has become somewhat normalized for me. This is a positive development because it allows me to create content without being overly concerned with this performance. If a video doesn't perform well, I become less bothered. I'm always striving to improve, but there's also many factors that contribute to a video's success, and it's unrealistic to expect every video to be your most viewed video. However, one thing I can consistently replicate is my passion for expressing my thoughts and educating others. Content creation has always been a love of mine ever since I started making videos in high school as a freshman. Instead of getting caught up in the numbers, focus on being your authentic self and the content will naturally follow. Funny thing, man, is when I upload a video these days, I don't even look at how many views I got. You know, I see it for like a split second and then I don't see it again until I get done with the video. Um, I just try my best on every video and now every video is not going to be number one and every video is not going to be... Um, as long or as comprehensive as some of my videos like this one in particular is mainly just me talking um but i really wanted to show how i became inspired by another youtube another youtuber and another creator and so i wanted to make this video just to uplift another creator who inspired me to keep going and keep being myself so this video is not really based on anything in particular but me showing my appreciation and also showing you how my mindset has changed throughout this whole process so anyway that's it, man. Thank you, Danny, for your videos. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of y'all's day or night. And I love you guys. Goodbye.
What's up, Greg? I hope you're all having a great day. Welcome back to my channel. This, of course, is another episode of That Yummy Yum. That Yummy Yum? That yummy yummy. Guys, why does everyone think that I wrote Justin Bieber's new song? I've gotten a weirdly high amount of tweets from people saying that Justin Bieber's new song and music video both seem like something I would come up with. They're usually paired with tweets saying that the new song is very bad and that the music video is very uncreative, so... I don't think it's a compliment. Didn't know you made music for Bieber now. You've come such a long way. I feel like Danny Gonzalez created this song and Justin stumbled upon it. This seems like a parody song Danny Gonzalez would write, like down to the dancing and everything. So Danny Gonzalez writes songs for Justin now? Well, I am a little bit flattered that uh, so many people thought that I wrote a song that in reality it took six people to write. Uh, I did not write Yummy. I did not consult on the project. I did not direct the music video. I didn't even instruct Justin on how to dance in the music video. I, I guess it was just sort of a coincidence that he ended up dancing like me. A lot of you, if not most of you, have probably heard Justin's new song, Yummy, by now. But there's something really weird going on with the way Justin Bieber and his team are marketing this song. They are so desperate to get this song to number one on the charts that they're doing the most ridiculous shit. And it's kind of sad to watch because it's just totally not working at all. And I think that it's very interesting and also not good. So I wanted to talk about it, and so now I'm gonna talk about it, and so let's complain. So because of copyright, I can't actually play any of the song, because I have a feeling even if I played one tiny little second of the song, Justin Bieber's team would copyright claim it immediately. But that won't stop me from talking about the lyrics in a little segment I like to call Lyrical Analysis. <laughs> All right, let's get started with lyrical analysis. I'm still in the same place, as you noticed. I'm not moving locations for this segment. This segment also takes place here. I'm not going back to the update corner. Please don't make me go back to the update corner. It hurts my knees. Yeah, you got that yummy yum. That yummy yum. That yummy yummy. Yeah, you got that yummy yum. That yummy yum. That yummy yummy. So already off to a... Rocky start. <laughs> so this song is apparently about Justin Bieber's wife, Haley, who uh, presumably has that yummy yum. There's not really much to learn about his wife from this song, besides the fact that she has that yummy yum. But I'm glad that I at least know a little bit about her now. And I think that we can all agree that there's nothing more romantic than talking to your wife like she's a little baby and calling her yummy and saying she's got that yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh, my baby's so yummy. Oh, she's so scrumptious. Oh, my baby's a yummy little girl. You got that yummy, yummy, don't you? It's weird, because I feel like rappers, a lot of times, will talk about, like, girls shaking that ass and hitting it from the back, and for some reason, just Justin Bieber telling his wife that she's got that yummy, yum seems more intimate to me than that. You got that yummy, yum. Yes, you do. You got that yummy, yum. Bonafide. Stallion. Ain't no stable. No, you stay on the run. Now, I think I know what he's going for here. He's trying to say his girl's like a free spirit. You know, she's a she's a horse running wild, running in the wind. But all I can imagine these lines meaning is you're a horse and you're not you're not stable. You're unstable and you may or may not be running from the law. My baby girl's a crazy horse. Oh, man. There's a description for this line on Genius and I thought that it would help explain the line better and be a little bit more flattering to his wife, but it actually <laughs> It actually makes it worse than I thought. Bieber compliments his wife, model Haley Baldwin, by calling her a bona fide stallion. Traditionally, a stallion is a male uncastrated horse, while its female counterpart is called a mare. You hear that, babe? You're a fucking horse with big ol' horse balls. And you're insane. Okay, actually... Maybe this does sound like something I would write. I kind of see it now. That jet set, watch the sunset, kinda, yeah, yeah. I don't even understand what this line means. We're on a jet and we're watching the sunset, kinda, yeah, yeah. He makes sure to throw in a mention of his clothing line, Drew House. Now the music video doesn't, in my opinion, really add much as it's mostly just Justin Bieber eating a lot of food and dancing, admittedly a little bit like how I dance. Now, while I thought the lyrics of the song themselves kind of did his wife a disservice by really only describing her as being yummy and also comparing her to a male horse, I personally think that the music video does even less to compliment his wife than the song does. Because the foods that he's eating and calling yummy are not very good looking foods. Damn, baby, you got that yummy yum. <laughs> You're looking like some pea jello. You look like a lobster. Ooh, baby got a body like a dead fish. So that's the side of the story that most people know. That's the song. It's kind of bad. That's the music video, it's pretty generic. And on its own, I don't really think that it's that much worth talking about. Like, sure it's bad, but pop stars release bad songs all the time. I'm also not one of those people that like hates Justin Bieber. I think that a lot of people, especially when he was younger, were like so harsh on him for no reason, just cause he was like a little boy 
with a high voice. Like he had the most disliked video on YouTube when he was like 12. Baby, when Justin Bieber released it, became the most disliked video on YouTube until I think 2018 when the YouTube Rewind took it over. That being said, I do have a problem with the very lame and honestly quite shady things Justin Bieber is doing to try to get his new song to number one on the charts. I noticed a few days ago, if you go to Justin Bieber's YouTube channel, he's made a shit ton of videos out of Yummy. It's not just the music video. You know how most artists will just do a music video or maybe sometimes they'll do a music video and a lyric video? Let's see how many videos Justin has made using Yummy. Justin Bieber Yummy official video. Justin Bieber Yummy lyric video. Justin Bieber Yummy animated video. Justin Bieber and Drew House Yummy animated video. Justin Bieber Yummy fan lip sync. Justin Bieber Yummy Believers React, which is just the exact same music video he posted before, but with reaction YouTubers popping in every now and again going like, wow! Oh, holy shit! No way! My heart is racing. My heart is racing, dude. Justin Bieber loves his wife? This girl, like, keels over the second the song starts. Was that her legitimate reaction to just the beat dropping and Justin starting to sing? That happens in all of Justin's songs. It's not very surprising or unique to this one. Oh, shit! Justin singing on this one? Yo, I did not expect that, guys. Woo! Woo! The beginning of the song. Fuck yeah! A lot of these reactions seem very forced. I'm not saying they are. I I'm sure there's people who legitimately enjoy this song. I'm not trying to knock that. L you can like whatever you want. But the people who made this video definitely cherry-picked the reactions. Uh, so much so that the reactions in this video seem, like, totally not real. Uh, and then the last one is called Yummy Food Fight. A food fight video? So not only do you have a music video, lyric video, two animated videos, two fan related videos, you also made a food fight video. What even is a food fight music video for a song? It honestly sounds kind of dope. I kind of want to start doing that for all of my songs from now on. Next song I drop, it's, it's only gonna be a food fight video. No music video, no lyric video. Just food fight video. Wait, the food fight video is just clips from movies and TV shows where they have food fights with the song Yummy playing over it. Oh. So, a lot of you might be wondering why. Why is Justin Bieber uploading so many videos with his song in it? Isn't a music video and lyric video, isn't that enough? I can't say for sure, but I think I know why. So for a while now, the Billboard charts for songs have included YouTube streams, but recently, just this year, I think January 3rd, they started counting YouTube streams for uh, albums as well, their album charts. So I assume he's doing this so that Yummy gets to the top of the charts for singles, and then once he releases the album that Yummy is on, that will also get to the top of the charts. So I I guess it makes sense why he's doing this, but it still seems like so lame. What, just uploading all of these videos that no, it's not adding anything. Does anyone care that some editor that Justin paid stitched together a bunch of food fight footage with his song over it? Like, how is that interesting or neat? I don't know why I said neat. How is that neat? Things need to be neat to be okay with me. That's why they call me Neat Dan. So not only does Justin Bieber have all of these songs on his channel, he's also clearly commissioned other popular YouTubers to post videos using the song. I'm assuming that he paid them in some way or just having his name attached to things is payment enough for some people. He made a video with Lele Pons. And when I say with, I mean, he wasn't actually there. He just FaceTimed Lele Pons at the beginning of the video. And then the rest of the video is Lele Pons and her friends dancing to the song. Hey, Justin. What's going on? Hey, I love your song, Yummy. I swear, and I'm not the only one that likes I promise, promise though. I promise, thank you, promise. Thank you, promise. I wonder if they made her say she likes Yummy. It seems like such a, a weird, unnatural way to start the video. Hey, Justin, I, I swear I like your song. I swear I do. I don't know how in this video, Justin Bieber comes across as so simultaneously disinterested, but also like super insecure about his song. Like what does he even do? He's like looking off to the side. He's not even looking at her. But then when she says she likes the song, he's like, do you promise? Yeah, I you promise though. So. You promise you like the song? Thank you promise. Thank you promise. Oh, you gotta prove it. I will prove it. I will prove it. I have all my friends here love it. So I'm gonna prove it. We all love it. <laughs> you gotta prove it. You gotta prove you like my song. I don't believe you. Cause everyone keeps saying they like the song, but then it's not number one on the chart. So I feel like people are lying to me. Prove you like the song. The only way I'll believe you is if you make a whole video of you and all of your famous friends dancing to it. You must dance with King Batch to my song. That's the only way you'll earn my trust. Oh, Justin Bieber is also dancing to the song. He's just on FaceTime. Why could he not even make the effort to be there? Did he even want to do this? 
Now I'm confused. Whose idea was this? It must just be Justin's marketing team. I don't really think that this is all Justin's big master plan to get to number one on the charts. I think it's a lot of people working for him and Justin sort of dragging his feet through this whole process. He also made a video with David Dobrik, which was actually pretty entertaining, at least a lot more entertaining than this Lele Pons video. It, it was mostly just him surprising people. David would bring people into his car, ask them about Justin Bieber, and then Justin Bieber would pop out. There were a couple times where people were like, ah, oh, I didn't like the song. And then Justin pretended to like, be mad about it. It was kind of funny. But then there was a part where he gets out of the car and there's like a huge group of people standing there and Justin has to make sure that everyone has heard and enjoys his song, Yummy. Have you guys heard the song yet, Yummy? Yeah! Can you sing it? Yeah! Wouldn't it be funny if the whole crowd was just like, no, we don't like it. It's not very good, Justin. And then he makes them prove it. Again, he makes them sing the song. He's like, you gotta prove that you have heard my song. Sing the word in the song. Another weird promotional thing that Justin was doing was in the lead up up to when he was dropping the song, he kept posting pictures of babies on his Instagram and the only caption he would put for them was hashtag yummy. Wait, I thought yummy was like a sexual thing. Is it not a sexual thing? Or at the very least a romantic thing? Was I wrong? Did I misinterpret the whole song? Cause surely Justin Bieber isn't saying that these babies are sexy. Right? So what 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 does yummy mean aside from like oh you're sexy? What what does what do these babies have that Justin Bieber's wife also has? Uh Feet? Mmm, that's that yummy yum. But the worst of all of the promotional stuff that Justin Bieber has done for his song Yummy is this series of images that he posted on Instagram. Now, I have heard that Justin didn't make this, one of his fan accounts did, and then he just reposted it on here. A lot of people are saying that he made this. I don't think that's true, because he'd be talking about himself in the third person. I don't think Justin Bieber makes any of the promotional graphics he puts on his Instagram. But at any rate, he still posted it on his personal Instagram. How to get Yummy to number one. Spotify, create a playlist with Yummy on repeat, and and stream it. Don't mute it. Play it at a low volume. Let it play while you sleep. If you're not from the US, you can download a VNP app. I assume they mean a VPN app, like ExpressVPN. Set the VPN to US and then create a Spotify account. Holy shit, what a shady thing to tell your fans to do. Play the song on repeat over and over all night while you sleep. It almost seems like an admission by whoever made this that the song isn't very good. Cause it's like, listen dude, you don't have to listen to it while you're awake, all right? Just put it on while you sleep. We just need to get Justin Bieber those sweet, sweet streams. iTunes, buy the song on iTunes, buy the song multiple times on Justin's website. The weird thing is, I feel like Justin Bieber is so rich that if he really wanted to, couldn't he just buy the song so many times that the song goes to number one on the charts? I don't know how flexible Billboard's rules are, but like a purchase is a purchase. And if he buys it 50 million times, you know, who's to say that's not legit? Remember, this is Justin's comeback. And if we all come together, we can give him his six number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Share this post with everyone you know. Let's do this. I, I mean, that sentence pretty much says it all. We can get Justin his sixth number one on the charts. Why does he need six? That That's like, the shadiest part of all of this is that Justin Bieber has already had five number ones. Why does he need to cheat the system to get his six? It seems like a weird ego thing where it's like, I have to be the most popular in the world. So anyway, that's my thoughts on the whole situation. I guess when you think about it, the moral of the story here is stream yummy. But by me, not Justin. <laughs> hey girl, you looking good. I hope this doesn't come off as uh, too inappropriate, but ha! You got that yummy yo. You're a ooey gooey, yummy, yummy, tasty little snack. I'ma hit it from the back, hit it from the back, babe. You're a chewy, chunky, gummy, wummy, tasty little treat. Put this record on repeat, listen while you sleep, baby. Baby, you're a princess, ooh, you look delicious. Make me want a chef's kiss, mwah, mwah, mwah. Yummy! Like a dead fish, face like scrambled eggs, bitch. That's a balanced breakfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know just what you wanna hear. You're looking like lasagna, and you know you make me wanna ooh. Make all your problems disappear. You look like ravioli, and I got the form you only You're my ooey gooey, yummy, yummy, tasty little snack. I'ma hit it from the back, hit it from the back, babe. You're a chewy, chunky, gummy, wummy, tasty little treat. Put this record on repeat. While you sleep, baby Damn, you looking sweet, babe Sweet, babe Good enough to eat, babe So I'ma eat your feet, babe Eat your feet and for dessert I'ma eat your shirt Eat your fucking shirt Hey, you know what would be kind of fun? Let's all game the billboard charts
hearts to make this number one Why won't the paparazzi leave me be? Please just treat me like a person, I'm not a piece of meat You're a ooey gooey, yummy, yummy, tasty little snack I'ma hit it from the back, hit it from the back, babe You're a chewy, chunky, gummy, wummy, tasty little treat Put this record on repeat, listen while you sleep You're a scrumptious little spicy hot tamale in my mouth Way too spicy, spicy, ouch, had to spit it out, babe You're a crazy fucking horse that's on the run from the police Crazy horse, don't hurt me, please, begging on my knees, baby this horse break so stream that instead all right well i hope you guys enjoyed this video if you're new here make sure you subscribe and turn on my notifications to join greg that's what i call my subscribers i call them greg isn't that kind of funny doesn't that kind of make you want to follow me just to kind of see what it's like all right thank you penny kyle for turning on my notifications you are truly greg i'll see you guys next time with a really interesting video where i forget my foot at home i leave for work and i forget my foot bye this video is over now yeah. over now Go find something else to watch Or just watch this video again. I know we had a lot of fun yeah. A lot of fun But you can't stay on this end screen forever no. This video is over now yeah. Over now So why are you still watching this? What's up, Greg? I hope you're having a great day. Welcome back to another episode of This Actually Happened, except it didn't. Lately, I've become a little bit obsessed with this radio show that I hear when I drive to the gym in the mornings a lot. It's called Waiting by the Phone. If you listen to good old Fred and Angie on 103.5 in Chicago, then there's a good chance that you've heard it before. I think that it is awful. And I've been listening to it a lot lately because it confuses me so much and now it's taking up all of my thoughts and so I need to make a video about it to vent so that I can stop thinking about it and I can transfer all of my concern to you guys. So that's what I'm gonna do. Basically the premise of the show is somebody calls the radio because they just went on a date, they had a great time, but now they're getting ghosted. What went wrong on the date? Why is this mean, mean person ghosting this nice, sweet person who's just looking for love? But then, Craziness ensues. Here's the thing though, all every single situation in all of these dates that they describe are so insane that they could not possibly be real. So in the past week, I downloaded the iHeartRadio app. I think I might be the first person to ever say that or admit that. So let's start off by listening to one, shall we? Uh, we're gonna listen to this one. It was actually recently voted the number one episode of Waiting by the Phone by Waiting by the Phone fans. They had a little contest. This one is called The Drug Deal. So let's take a listen. Why'd they get blown off? We'll find out now in Waiting by the Phone with Fred and Angie. Hi, Allison. How are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Very well. Good morning. Thanks for being on the show. It's Waiting by the Phone. Tell us about this guy, Matthew, how you guys met and where you stand right now. I like the little club beat that they always play at the beginning. It's this little like... <laughs> and they're like, so this really nice guy that you really like is not calling you back and now you're all alone. Tell us more about how this crippling failure is affecting you. He came by and picked me up and we went out to dinner and then a movie and then drinks after. He didn't reach out to me at all after the date, and I was kind of confused about that. This girl is saying that the date went great, nothing weird happened, they just, it was just a normal date, and nothing went wrong, and she can't possibly imagine why this guy would not want to call her back. So now let's listen as Fred and Angie call this guy and ask him why he won't call her back. Welcome back. Let's call Matthew. You met through some friends. You were set up. Right. And you want to know what's going on. Yeah, I'm really interested to see what he has to say. We'll call him right now. She's very interested to see what weird reason he could have for not wanting to call her back. Let's take a look. Hello? Hi, Matthew. Good morning, Fred and Angie. Paulina Kaling calling for Fred and Angie in the morning on KISS FM. I have to tell you, before we go any further with the call, that we are on the radio right now, and I need your permission to keep talking. Is it cool if we keep going with the call? Yeah. We're calling on behalf of a woman named Allison who reached out to us and said that you guys were set up and you had a great date. She kind of wanted to know what's going on while you're ghosting. We went on a date, which is supposed to be a movie and then after the movie she said let's go get some drinks and i you know it sounded it wasn't part of the plan it was all going really well and on the way to get drinks she said let's go to target and she tells me exactly where to park which is not anywhere near the front of the store <laughs> and then i look over there's somebody in the car his window rolls down and a drug deal happens <laughs> they were in the middle of a date having a great time and she thought hey you know what would be really fun a fun thing to do with this stranger 
who I know nothing about. I'm gonna take him to deal some cocaine. At the very least, this girl has some very serious time management issues. She booked a date at the same time as a drug deal. That's a big no-no, we all know that. We all learned that in Drug Dealer 101. You don't book a date at the same time as a drug deal. So now that she knows why this dude won't call her back, let's see how she responds. Will she be like, oh, of course. Taking a stranger to a drug deal on a date is a weird thing to do. Let's find out. You did a drug deal on a date. I mean, I didn't make you do any you made of the drugs. You did a drug deal. You gave me money. I handed him money. He handed me cocaine. I handed you cocaine. I became a drug dealer in that situation. You know what? Grow up. Grow up? Huh? Why is she so flabbergasted by the idea that this dude didn't want to do a drug deal on a date? Even people who deal drugs know that you should probably get to know someone and, you know, build trust with someone before you reveal to them that you are a drug dealer. Allison, you have to acknowledge that maybe if he's not into that, then he doesn't want to get nailed for buying it. Oh, please. He wasn't buying it. We were just out to have a good time, and so I was trying to make it better. Okay. Look, so is there any way, would you get past this, Matthew? So then Fred and Angie ask if there's any way that the dude could get past this and go on another date with her. He obviously says no. And that is the end of the episode. That is an episode of Waiting by the Phone. So aside from how wild that was, it's kind of like a weird premise to begin with, right? Like it's about people who are getting ghosted. Their texts aren't being answered. Their calls aren't being returned. But they want a second date. So they figure, hey, maybe if I call the radio and I get the radio host to interrogate my date, they'll want a second date with me. Because that's really what people want is to be interrogated on the radio. And the fact that the premise is weird would be forgivable if it weren't for the fact that this entire show is completely fake. That's right, the date didn't even happen. The whole show is fake, the date was fake, the story's fake, cocaine's not even real. Even though they do a couple things to try to make you believe it's real, like when the person answers the phone, Fred and Angie have to ask if it's okay that they're on the radio, making it seem like they need to get consent because this person hasn't signed a release. But all in all, they do such a bad job of making this seem real. For one, they seem to do this show a lot. I think they do it multiple times a week. In fact, on the podcast page, they upload one of these podcasts every weekday, so five times a week. So you'd think they would need people to be calling in constantly to volunteer to be on this show. But one thing that I've noticed while listening to the show is they never advertise how to get on the show. They never say a number to call or a website to go to or an email to email. There is no way, from listening to the show at least, to get on the show. So I decided, okay, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I just have to do a little bit of digging to get on the show. So a couple days ago, I tried my best to get on waiting by the phone and here's what happened so I'm just gonna google it to see if there's a number listed anywhere all right so I googled waiting by the phone kiss FM phone number the first option is just an episode of waiting by the phone that you can listen to and then the second one is best of waiting by the phone these are some videos of waiting by the phone okay so there's no number listed anywhere for you to call waiting by the phone literally no information on how to get on waiting by the phone so what I think I'm gonna do is over here on kiss FM's website you can click there's an option to contact kiss FM so so I'm gonna do that and then there's a few numbers here studio line business line advertise with us So I'm just gonna try calling the studio line and see if I can get on waiting by the phone. Okay. I am calling kiss FM's studio line <laughs> It's not pick up. Can you even call kiss FM at all? I've been waiting for three minutes now and no one has picked up, so I'm gonna hang up. Can I tune into the radio right now and see what's going on? Maybe they're doing something where they're using all the phone lines. Okay, no, they're just playing Selena Gomez. So, no reason that they shouldn't be able to pick up the phone. I assume they have employees that do that. Maybe I'll try calling the business line. Waiting by the phone is serious business, so you gotta call the business line. Thank you for calling iHeartMedia Chicago. Our office is now closed. I found an email form I can fill out to send to them, so maybe I'll do this instead. Help! I want to be on waiting by the phone. Please help! Yes, I would like a reply. Yes, I am not a robot. And submit. Your request has been received. Alright, we'll see what happens. Alright, it's the next day. It is 10.54. So hopefully this is within office hours of the KISS FM studio line. I'm gonna try calling them again. 
They're not gonna pick up, are they? They're never gonna pick up. Okay, so I'm just gonna assume that their studio line doesn't exist and there's actually no way to contact Kiss FM unless they ever respond to my email request, uh, which I also doubt they will do. So yeah, it's impossible to get on the show because everyone on the show is an actor, and if you are not an actor, then you cannot be on the show. Alrighty, let's check out another episode, why don't we? This one's called The Dump and Dash. How you doing? Doing very well, how about yourself? Uh, very well, thanks so much for calling. Waiting by the phone, tell us about your <laughs> date with Stephanie, how you guys met, and, and where you guys stand right now. Well, we were talking for a bit on Bumble. Uh, we, we went out for drinks, think of Mayo. We even hooked up, which was awesome. Oh man, they hooked up? That sounds awesome. It might have just been, you know, a uh, kind of a one night thing because she hasn't responded to any of my texts warmly or hasn't uh, jumped on anything. Okay. And that you didn't want a one night thing. Like you obviously you've reached out for to see her again. You want to repeat at least. Well, that's where we come in. We'll call and ask some questions. You'll be on the phone. Maybe we can straighten this out and set you guys up on another date. All right. So the date went great. They even hooked up. It was awesome. And this dude couldn't think of any reason that this girl wouldn't want to text him back. So let's see what the girl has to say when they call her. Can you tell us where you guys stand? Um, so he called you? Right, yeah. Right, he's called waiting by the phone. He's a little confused. He reached out to us uh -oh. and told us about uh -oh. the day. He likes you, wants to see you again, and is hoping we can put you guys back together. Uh, probably not. <laughs> so what happened? Because he, I mean, what? why are you just not interested? Or did something go on? Or did he say something? Or... Um, I mean, it's it just like, uh, uh, all right, he just, he sh the bed. He pooped in her bed, left, and then apparently was like, damn, that was a great date. I killed it. I didn't think I had it in me, but I hooked up with her and pooped in her bed. That was awesome. I woke up and there was in my bed. <laughs> I forgot to mention that Joe uh, is here. Joe, you, you left that detail oh out. Oh my God. That's a key detail in all of this. Oh my God. It's not, it's not a real detail. So he tries to defend himself for a little bit, being like, what? I didn't know that. I must have been so drunk that I didn't even remember that I pooped in your bed. I didn't know. But then like two seconds later, he admits that he did it and that he knew he did it. Oh my God. Wouldn't I know if like, I, you know, it was my, my sh because like it would be in my pants, not on my bed, all right? <laughs> yeah, Buster, let's get one thing straight. When I poop my pants, I know it because it's in my pants and not all over my bed. Why would I just randomly the bed and not remember? I was also drunk. I wasn't necessarily just embarrassed. I, I barely knew that. He barely knew? How do you barely know that you pooped in someone's bed? Oh, come on, dude. I barely even knew I pooped in her bed. Like, yeah, I know that I pooped somewhere that wasn't the toilet. And yeah, I noticed there was poop in her bed. But how was I supposed to know those two things were related? So this whole time, this dude knew that he pooped in this girl's bed. He knew it from the start, but he still went for days without her texting him back, wondering why she's not texting him back, and then he decided to call the radio so these two radio hosts would harass this poor girl and ask her why won't you call him back, never once thinking it might be because he pooped in her bed. This show is insane. This show is a nightmare. So you might notice from the two examples that I've shown that the show is a little bit formulaic. That's one of the big issues I have with it, is that like every episode plays out the exact same way, which one could argue is a huge indication that the show is scripted. One could argue it, and one does. It is I. I am the one. The person who calls in always starts off by saying like, we had such a great time, everything was great, I can't figure out why they won't call me back. A lot of times they even throw in like, we went back to my place and hooked up, at which point Fred and Angie are always like, oh, wow, they hooked up. That's kind of interesting. And then of course they call the ghoster and it turns out that they're not the weird one. It was the ghosty all along. And the reason they ghosted him is because they did some weird shit on their date, like poop in their bed or take them to a drug deal. This happens in literally every single episode. This one's called The Competitive Eater. After we do waiting by the phone, hi Greg. Hi. Oh shit, this one's about Greg. Hey Greg, let's hear how Greg fucked up. So we can just skip past the exposition for this one. We know that the date went well and he can't figure out why this girl won't call him back. Let's just skip to the part where they call her. I guess the best way to put it was like, he embarrassed himself really, really badly and he embarrassed me. How did he do um, that? Because he said everything went really well and he had a good time. He didn't share anything. <laughs> so, so what happened? How did he embarrass you both? Wait, hold on. 
Greg did something weird? What a twist! But he said everything on the day went fine! And now you're telling me that everything didn't go fine? And Greg did something weird? I don't know, man. Seems a little sus to me. When we were sitting at the bar having a drink, and all of a sudden, he's on the stage with, like, a bunch of other men and a woman, actually, and there are, like, piles of soft tacos and pitchers of water and... Just food everywhere. He took off his button down shirt and he was wearing his wife beater <laughs> underneath. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, the visual's amazing on this. Okay. And so you're just you're still sitting there at the table because you know you were on this <laughs> dinner date and so you're you're gonna be a spectator now. Okay. This dude's kind of a savage. So this dude goes on a first date with a girl and leaves the girl halfway through the date to go enter a competitive taco eating contest. And then I guess leaves the date thinking that he totally killed. Killed it. Very typical date, if you asked me. We talked about work, exchanged pleasantries, made small talk. I ate 100 tacos, threw up, and kissed her goodbye. Just another classic first date with Greg. After the whole thing is over, he comes back and he's starting to complain about his stomach hurt. So hold on one second, so you're being like so dramatic. And then Greg doubles down. He's like, wait, 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 wait. You are being so dramatic right now. I thought you'd think it was really romantic if I shoved 50 tacos down my throat and then got a tummy ache and had to go home. I don't know. I maybe misjudged the situation as far as like, I don't think that we're compatible. Now he's like trying to break up with her. He's like, look, I just don't know if we're compatible, okay? I don't know if I could ever be with someone that didn't want to watch me strip down to my tank top and eat soft tacos by the dozen. It's like, dude, we've all already established that you're not compatible. That's why she didn't call you. I guess it's important that you come to this conclusion too, but don't act like you're the one who decided it. These characters are so bizarre, and I understand that that's the point. Like, that's where the entertainment value comes from. It's like, whoa, this wacky thing Thing happened. But KISS FM releases one of these episodes every weekday. So they expect us to believe that they find five of these scenarios every week. Mind you, without knowing that the scenario is this crazy beforehand, they just know that there's a very normal sounding guy who had a very normal sounding date and now someone's not responding to them. Like, how many people would you have to go through until you got to a situation that was this weird? Because I feel like 99% of the people they call would just be like, oh, uh, yeah, we just didn't really have a strong connection and I didn't really feel like seeing him again. Because obviously, not every single first date goes wrong because someone started competitively eating or pooping in someone's bed. All right, here's one more episode called The Crazy You Date. Hey, Zach, how you doing? Oh, you know, I'm all right. Yeah, I went on this date with this girl, um, and, uh, I had a really great time, you know, we got drinks, we even hooked up, that was cool. Um, well, that's all. Oh. That's all good stuff. Bam, you go bam, on a day, bam. You know, oh wow, you hooked up, huh? Bam, bam, bam. Is that how it went? Did it go bam, bam, bam? Hello. Hi, is this Elizabeth? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Fred and Angie from the morning radio show on Kiss FM in Chicago. I'm sorry to bother, but I have to tell you that we are on the radio right now. I would need your consent to continue yeah. with the call. Is that okay if we uh, talk for a couple of minutes? Okay. Oh, another thing. Why is every person that they call always, like, just cool with being on the radio without any warning? They always pick up and they're immediately just, like, cool with talking about their sex life and their dating life on the radio. They're just like, hey, so we heard that you had sex with this guy and now you won't call him or text him. Would you care to tell millions of people why you did that? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Because I feel like if they called me, it would probably just be like, hey, Danny, we're with the radio. We just have a couple questions about someone you went on a date with and hooked up with. Do you mind being on the radio real quick? Yes. Or I just wouldn't even pick up because I never pick up unknown numbers and I'm pretty sure no one does. And this right here is exactly why. Because those pesky telemarketers always trying to get you on the radio. Yeah, another weird thing is that they even pick up in the first place. The show airs at like 9 a.m. So presumably a lot of these people must be at work, right? Why are these people so cool with just like talking about their dating life out in the open at work? Just in your cubicle like, oh, you want to ask me about a girl I hooked up with? Sure. Okay, so basically right after after we hooked up, this girl put a huge poopy in my sock drawer. Excuse me, sir, this is an office. If we could keep private conversations outside if you need to step outside. Fuck off. Yeah, and then she peed in all my water bottles. Yeah, an entire 24 pack. I don't even know how she found the time to do that without me noticing. All right, anyway, let's find out why this girl is ghosting this guy. <clears throat> wow, well, he really freaked me out. Why? Um, during, you know, we went on this date and we are having a good time and, and talking about all those shows that we're binging. And I started talking about this show, You, that I'm obsessed with. I thought that, you know, that was the end of it. And then we go back to his place and, like, to hook up. And um, and then he disappeared for a while. And then he came back wearing oh, no. this ball cap, like that guy Joe. 
Wearing the hat? Uh, and a backpack. Oh, yeah, no. he's wearing a ball cap and a backpack. And, and oh, no. he started talking like Joe, and it freaked me out. Whoever writes these, what kind of people do you think exist? Is this something that you think happens on first dates, like, all the time? So this girl said she was obsessed with you, and then they go back, in her words, because she thought they were gonna hook up, and then he leaves for a bit and comes back dressed up as the creepy guy from you. I don't know if he's, like, a murderer or something, because I've never watched the show. He turns into the... Psychopath? Yeah, he's there calling me back. Oh my um, god, I would have ran so fast. <laughs> I know. I'm the guy's a right psychopath now. in the show, yeah. and, and you're embodying that. Yeah, I thought I thought you were into that, Beck. I thought you would like it if I, for all intents and purposes, a stranger to you, dressed up as a creepy psychopath from a TV show while you're alone with me in my apartment. I thought you'd think it was hot, babe. How was I supposed to know? Wait, the weird thing is that the dude said that they hooked up at the beginning. Remember? Bam, bam, bam. But the girl says they just went there because she thought they were gonna hook up, but then he left and came back dressed up as this dude from you. So did whoever wrote the script just forget that they had the guy say that they hooked up? Or does the guy think that dressing up as a character from you counts as hooking up? Does he think that's what hooking up is? Anyway, that's the end of that episode. I would just really like to be in the minds of Fred and Angie and whoever writes the show. I don't know if it's Fred and Angie or if they even know that the show is fake. Maybe they don't even know. Maybe someone else entirely writes the show and the producers at the show do the whole thing, but Fred and Angie don't even know that it's fake and they think they're really on the phone with real people. Because a lot of the times the reactions do seem surprisingly genuine, but the show is definitely fake. I just don't know if Fred and Angie know this. All right guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're new here and you're not subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe and turn on my notifications to join Greg. Greg is what I call my subscribers. We're an army, baby. Fastest growing army on the whole internet. Don't look that up. All right, thank you, Stella, for turning on my notifications. You are truly Greg. I'll see you guys next time with a really interesting video where I climb onto the top of the Empire State Building with a little girl in my hand and swat away planes, but then I die. Bye! This video is over now. Yeah. Over now. Go find something else to watch Or just watch this video I know we had a lot of fun Yeah, a lot of fun But you can't stay on this end screen forever no. This video is over now Yeah, over now So why are you still watching this?